Have you ever wondered how much power does the devil have? So many times we've said the devil made me do it. Well, in all probability, you did it because you belong to the devil. But did the devil make you do it? What can the devil make you do? And what is your means of resisting the devil? Well, that's what we're going to look at today as we look at the book of Ephesians, a book that tells us about the power of being in Christ. Ephesus, and you think of the letter to the Ephesians, you have to think about spiritual warfare. You have to think about the power of the enemy. Because when you understand the background of the people living in Ephesus, you can understand why Paul wrote what he wrote, why he told them that they would be blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now, your assignment was to read through Ephesians. Your assignment was to mark every reference to Paul, every reference to Paul because he was the author, every reference to the Ephesians because they were the ones that Paul was writing to, the recipients. We told you to mark every reference to Paul in blue and every reference to the Ephesians in the color orange so that you could look down and and see what you can learn about the Ephesians just from what he says to them. Well, as you read through the book of Ephesians, one of the things you see him talking about is you see him talking about the fact that they are Gentiles. And in Ephesians chapter 2, as you would go through and color in orange every reference to the Ephesians, in chapter 2 verse 11, it would say, therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, and, and he goes on and he talks about the Gentiles, Gentiles in the flesh. You were born a Gentile. All right, so one of the things that you would have written about the Ephesians when you made your list, when you looked at every place that you marked, every place you colored orange, and, and you wrote down what you learned about them, what the text told you about who or what or when or why or, or uh, uh, where or how. Those are the five W's and an H. And so you would mark that and you would say, hey, they were Gentiles. All right, and then you come to chapter 3, verse 1, and it says, For this reason I, Paul, which you would mark blue, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Well, there you would write down, oh, Paul was a prisoner. He was a prisoner for the sake of the Gentiles. He was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And, and you would find out in studying the text that Paul was put in prison. He was put in prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was put in prison for taking the gospel to the Gentiles. All right. And so he was a prisoner for the sake of the Gentiles. You would put down again that these that he was writing to were Gentiles. Now, when you study the Bible inductively, and by inductive, let me just explain it again. Inductive means you remove the middleman and you go directly to the Word of God yourself. A middleman would be a teacher. You say, well, are teachers wrong? Well, then I shouldn't be teaching if they are. And you shouldn't have a pastor. No, a pastor is very important. He's to be your pastor teacher, your shepherd and your teacher. But God also wants you and I to be able to study God's Word for ourselves so that I know whether what I'm being taught is right or wrong. And I want to know that because the Bible says that until I grow up in the knowledge of God, then I can be liable to, to people who are trying to deceive me, who are, are trying to lead me 
astray. So I've got to know truth. I've got to discover it for myself. Now that's why we offer you a free study guide. Why you can go to preceptsforlife.com and download a free study guide. A study guide that will help you learn the skills of observation, discovering what does the text say, interpretation, understanding what does it mean, and then application, knowing how you're to live in the light of it or how you're to change your thinking. And, and I just put my hands on my, on my cheekbones and go and turn my head because application many times is not always doing something. Sometimes it's simply saying, hey, I believe the wrong thing and I'm going to change my mind. Now, those are the basic steps of inductive Bible study, observing, discovering what does the text say, interpreting it, what does it mean? And if you'll do your observation and you'll observe and you'll observe and you'll observe and you'll look at it and discover what it says and follow these, these um, study skills that we're teaching you, that I'm teaching you, then you're going to have interpretation fall in your lap. And because God says what he means and he means what he says and scripture interprets scripture. And, and I mean, you're going to learn. And so then you take what you learn and you apply it. Now remember, in the opening to this program, we talked about warfare. We talked about the devil. We talked about being afraid of him. We talked about being under his power. And as you studied through Ephesians, you saw that they were under his power. Because when you made the list in Ephesians chapter 2, it says in verse 1, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is working in the sons of disobedience. And when you read that, and when you get to the lesson, when we come to that, one of the things we would tell you is put a red pitchfork over every reference to the devil over every reference to evil spirits, because then you can see if the devil's on any page and you can put that red pitchfork there and then you can get, you know, a profile on the devil so that you know what he's like, you know what his tactics are like and you know what to do. Well, you see that these people, these Gentiles in Ephesus walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is working in the sons of disobedience. Now, just think with me. Think planet Earth, that's where we are, that's where we're sitting, that's where we're standing, that's where we're moving, that's where we're living. Then think about the air. Not the atmosphere, but the stratosphere. Go beyond the atmosphere to what you can see and go up there and there is a prince, a prince of the power of the air. He is a spirit and he is working. He is currently at work in the sons of disobedience, in those who have refused to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, and that he is the only way to God. So if people do not believe that, then what has happened to them is they are sons of disobedience, and they are walking according to the prince of the power of the air, according to this world. Now, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 tells us that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. All right, so we're going through, you're studying, you're making this list of everything that you learn about the Ephesians. Well, if you really want to understand what Paul is telling you, you need to find out, does he talk about Ephesus anyplace else in the scriptures? And the answer is yes. He talks about Ephesus in the book of Acts. Now, what I want us to do is I want us to go back to Acts chapter 9. I want us to go back to the time when Paul 
became a child of God. Remember, he was on the road to Damascus. Remember, he was persecuting Christians. And remember that he was in darkness. He was in, in darkness because he did not believe in the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, he was persecuting those who were of the way, those who were followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus had said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Well, Paul did not like that. His name was Saul, and, and Saul is his Jewish name, and Paul is his Gentile equivalent. So in Acts chapter 9, he's referred to as Saul. So Saul's going out. He's arresting them. He's putting them in prison. He's consenting to their death. And all of a sudden, a light appears to him. We know that light is Jesus. And, and Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, who are you persecuting? And, and uh, why are you persecuting me? Excuse me. And Saul says to him, who are you? And he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Well, at that moment... Saul can no longer see. For the next three days, and you can go back and you can read Acts chapter 9 after the program's over. But for the next three days, Paul doesn't eat, he doesn't drink, and he sits in absolute darkness and he is praying. Now, one of the things that we have to remember is when God is going after those that he has chosen before the foundation of the world, those that he wants to, to adopt as, as children into his dear family. He will move heaven and earth to reach them. And this is what's happening among many, many Muslims. Many Muslims are, are having visions. They're having dreams. And in that vision, in that dream, they see a man in white. They ask that man, or that man says, I'm Jesus. And, and many times it's Jesus whom they are persecuting because they're persecuting other uh, Christians and they're persecuting Christians and they're persecuting Jews because they have been told and taught in the Quran that they are the enemy and they need to get rid of them. And when they are persecuting them, many times, or when they are searching for God or they want to know God in the earnestness of their heart, they will have a vision. And do you know what happens? Do you know what happens when many of them are having that vision? It's very similar to what happened to the Apostle Paul because God is about to deliver them out of the kingdom of darkness and bring them into his glorious light to take them from the power of Satan and let them know the power of Jesus. What happens? I'll tell you right after this important announcement. It's exciting. You don't want to miss it. come back to because I would want to know. I mean, you're telling me this, but is it really happening? Oh, yes, there's story after story about Muslims coming to know Jesus Christ. How do they know? Well, many times what happens is the Jesus film comes in. And when the Jesus film is shown, they see it and they say, that's the man. That's the man that I saw in my dreams. That's the man I saw in my vision. Or that's the man that appeared to me. And they come to know Jesus Christ. Campus Crusade could tell you those stories. Others, we, we share the Jesus film in our ministry overseas. It's a wonderful, wonderful movie. But we can tell you story after story of that way that God brings people to himself. You see, sometimes they don't have the Word of God. Sometimes they're not going to hear the Word of God. It's not in a country like ours. And so God will move heaven and earth to bring them to himself. Those that are hungering, those that are thirsting for righteousness, those that long to know truth, those that want truth and not a lie. Well, there were people in Ephesus People in Ephesus that were Gentiles, as you know, there were Jews living there, but there were Gentiles. It was primarily a Gentile city. And God sent Paul to Ephesus. Let's see how it happened. I want to go back to Acts chapter 9 very quickly. Because when Ananias appears to 
Saul and, and, and lays his hands on him, he's doing it because this is what God has told Ananias. Ananias is afraid of Paul because he has heard what Paul has been doing. And he says, Lord, now are you sure? Because Ananias has a vision. Are you sure you want me to go? And God says to him, he says, go in verse 15, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. He would suffer prison. He would suffer prison for the sake of being obedient to Jesus Christ and taking the message to the Gentiles. Well, that's in Acts chapter 9. And what we want to do is we want to go to Acts chapter 18. Because in Acts chapter 18, in verse 18, Paul is on a missionary journey. He's on his second missionary journey journey. And on that second missionary journey, it says in verse 18, Paul, having remained many days longer, and this is in Corinth, says, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. And Sencrea, and I've stood at the port of Sencrea, and it's just a little sandy beach right now, he had his hair cut for he was keeping a vow. They came to Ephesus. So he leaves Sencrea, which is, is down south of Corinth, and he sails over across the Aegean Sea, and he lands and he goes to the city of of Ephesus. It's, it's near present day Kushadasi today in, in Turkey, in, in the western part of Turkey. And he gets there, he entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Now this is what he always did. He went to the Jew first because the gospel went to the Jew first. You're going to appreciate that much more later in uh, the book of Ephesians when we look at it. And it says, when they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent but taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills. He was a man that knew that God was to be in charge of his life and he only wanted to do what God wanted him to do. What about you, beloved? I'm telling you, this is the way that you have victory over the evil one. You say, God, I choose you. And God, I will to do your will, no matter the cost, even if I suffer, I'm going to be your man. I'm going to be your woman. And if you say that to God, God's going to use you mightily in his own individual will, uh, in his own individual way, according to the kind intention of his will. You'll see that phrase in the book of Ephesians. And he says, I will return again if God wills. And he sets sail from Ephesus. Well, when he's on his third missionary journey, he comes to Ephesus. And in verse 8, it says he entered the synagogue of Acts chapter 19, sorry. He entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them, now these are the Jews, about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. He went to a school, a Gentile school. And it says, and God was performing, and this took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia, now Asia in those days is not the Asia we think of today, but Asia is Western Turkey. So that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Gentiles. And God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. That's where you want to put a red pitchfork because the evil spirits were leaving because Jesus had come through the ministry of Paul. And it says, but also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And so they would go. They saw Paul do it and they'd say, Paul said it in the name of Jesus. I'll do it in the name of Jesus whom Paul 
preaches. Well, listen to what happens. And it says, and seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to both all, to both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. What do we see here? We see the power of the name of Jesus when it's spoken by a believer in Jesus. We see that it is a power that subdues the power of the evil one. Now, this was a city in which there was the great temple of Artemis. And, and, and this temple drew believers in Artemis from all over the world. They came to worship Artemis, or her name was Diana. Her image had fallen down out of heaven to earth, and they built a great temple there. It became a real source of income to that city. And I mean, they d developed their own bank and, and everything. People came from all over. Well, know this, that Corinthians teaches us behind every idol, there's an evil spirit. So this was a city sitting in great darkness. This was a Gentile city with a few Jews there, but the Jews hadn't come to know Jesus Christ. And so Satan reigned. They were living according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. But Paul came and he brought the message, the message of life, the message of freedom, the truth that sets you free. And that's why he opens up and says he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's why he's going to tell him that he has put all things in subjection under the feet of Jesus. Principalities and powers and rulers and spiritual wickedness and high places are all under the feet of Jesus. Oh, beloved, this is what we're going to see as we study the book of Ephesians. You need not fear if Christ is in you, for greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. look at our precept for life, what I want to do is I want to take you back to Acts again, because it's so neat to see the power of God. Listen to what it says. It says, this became known to all, both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus. The fact that, that the evil spirits would look at, at, at the one that was saying, I adjure you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out of them. And the evil spirits were smart enough to say, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? You're speaking, but you're not speaking from a position of authority. You're not speaking from a position of, of power. And this is what you're going to see in the book of Ephesians as you study it. You're going to see that God seats us in a position of authority with Christ Jesus. You're going to see that God gives us his power, that power that raised Jesus from the dead and seated him in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named in heaven and earth. You're going to see it. But now watch what it says. It says, and fear fell upon them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. All of a sudden, they heard the name that's above every other name, the name before whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The name of Jesus was being magnified. 
And it goes on to say, and many also of those who believed kept coming and confessing and disclosing their practices. I've walked in darkness. I've been doing this. And it says, and many of those who practice magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. What is your precept for life today? Your precept for life is this, that you have one offensive weapon against the enemy. It's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And as that word grows mightily in you, and as that word it, it prevails over all the, the, the false teaching that you've had or the false beliefs that you've developed over your life, then you're going to know more and more the power of God in your life. And the more you know about God, the less you'll be concerned about the devil because you'll remember where you're seated in that position of power in Christ. It's what Ephesians is about. Thank you for watching today. All the programs you see on Precepts for Life are available on CD and DVD. To order your copy of today's program, log on to our website at preceptsforlife.com. To download your free copy of the study guide or to find out more about Precept Ministries International, click on our website or call us today at 1-800-763-1990. Join us for our next program as Kay shares more Precepts for Life.